This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Visit them via the link in the description below for all your PCB services. I've been using them for years, so make sure you try them out. Hi everyone, welcome back to the workshop and it's repair time again. And this time I've got an Agilent E3632A DC power supply. It's a single rail power supply, works across two different modes. 15 volts 7 amp or 30 volts at 4 amp at the press of a button single rail power supply there with the sense terminals either side and uh, you can adjust the voltage and current settings up on the rotary encoder up on here so uh, first thing I'm going to do obviously is let's uh, open the case up let's take a quick look inside and let's check it out this is one heavy power supply. It's a 9 kilogram power supply which is about 20 pounds. And believe me, it is heavy. You really, if you're going to put it on a shelf, you really need a, a substantial shelf to uh, basically take the weight of one or two of these, that's for sure. So let's get uh, let's get it opened up and take a look inside. Oh, here we go. I really want to get my teeth into something where I have to dig out the scope and all that sort of thing there and get it repaired so I'm not really sure how you get into this thing so I'm just basically undoing the screws that I can see oh wait a minute that needs a special there we go So we'll take a look inside, make sure everything's looking reasonable and then I'll do my usual and we'll measure the resistance across the primary winding, make sure that's intact before I go near putting power into it. Taking a look at the back of it whilst we're here, you've got the mains IEC connector there and it's set for 230 volts at the moment. I will need to adjust that to 240. We've got a serial connection here, a GPIB there, and a, a fan on the back. So let's see if I can't get into it. Ah, oh, here we go. I think. And, uh, well, there's the reason for the weight. That is one big transformer. And interestingly, on the heatsink here, on the main, the main uh, heatsink here, there's some uh, writing. So, I don't have a translation right now, but I think I'll send that to my friend who translated the Chinese or Taiwanese or whatever writing was on the side of the... 34405A multimeter and, uh, and translated that for me so I'll do the same with that and hopefully I'll get that as I continue the video. Well so far it is absolutely filthy inside. This power supply is this power supply has obviously been switched on and left on for hours, days, months at a time. Of course given its age but uh, there's just a coating of dust everywhere. Um, so I'm going to have to try and clean that up a little bit, but uh, first things first, let's take a look at the IEC connector in the back and see if we're getting a primary winding. Right, here we go. Power switch is off at the moment. Uh, we're getting about, oh wow, 50 odd mega ohms. Uh, that's probably okay. And the power switch in. Um, we're getting 109, 200 ohm on the primary winding, but that's with it set to 230, so I'm going to change that to 240 now and see if we can, I presume it can be set to 240. There we go. So what you do is take out this little module here and rotate it round. Oh, well in this particular case here, 
it doesn't have a 240 it's got a 115 it's 230 there's nothing marked on that side and 100 on that side so I'm not really sure yes on the bottom there helps when you read it a eh? 100 volt 115 and 230 volt plus or minus 10 percent hmm. Stick it back to 230. Okay. Eleven ohms. Wow, what's going on there? Something weird going on there. 11 ohms now. 10 ohms. 11 ohms. That was 200 before. So on here we've got the little fuse carrier but it's also got this little coil of wire. I presume that's just for the loop there. Now it is a bit discoloured. It's a little bit odd. Something's been arc in there. I think that's probably from a blown fuse at some point and it's arced right across possibly and uh, yeah I discolored that there because it's only dark on one side probably the side it was facing the fuse so yeah and the size of the fuse that's in it at the moment it's 2.5 amp so 230 volt 2.5 amp so yeah that's right enough well, here's a possible issue. Going back to the fuse carrier again, you've got these metal pins here, which look like they make contact inside the fuse carrier. Uh, maybe to bridge some spades on the other side. And they're absolutely blackened, as you can see. And this one at the back there, I'm not sure if you can see that there you can see it's there's been some attempt at it sliding in against something on the inside and the same with this one here so I suspect that uh, we've got a problem possibly with those so I'll give those a clean up and I'll uh, actually I think I'll give the ends of this uh, spring a little bit of a clean up as well Make sure it gives a good contact into the back of the fuse carrier. It's uh, maybe needs stretched a little as well, um, just to give it a little bit more force. Because I mean, it, it is a bit shorter than the fuse, as you can see. Um, of course, this is spring bound as well. So yeah, I think we need a little bit of work on the fuse carrier before I go any further. Might be responsible for those erroneous um, resistance readings in the primary. Okay, that's the contacts cleaned up a little bit more and I've stretched that spring a little bit more as well and just rubbed down the ends of it and we'll uh, try that and see how we get on. Well, it seems to be reliable enough at 4.2 uh, maybe just the design of the windings on the transformer 4 ohms can be okay but I was expecting more than that but we'll go with that and we'll see what happens next Right, we're ready for a power up. I've got it plugged into my 10 milliamp RCD just in case. I don't know if I can just show you over there, and that's my 10 milliamp RCD. Um, quite a low value, but uh, it's uh, great just to have that extra chance of protection. So let's uh, zoom in on the front panel. There we go, and let's power it up. See what happens. I've got a display there, I've got the fan in the back running, I can hear it. We've got a single beep and we've got nothing on the display. Now I've never used one of these power supplies before so I don't really know how it should power up. But it is beeping every now and then by the sounds of it. I'm 
getting something on the display there, unreg when I hit the recall button. And I've got a single beep every now and then. And the only thing that responds is the recall button which brings up this unreg. Well, it looks like any other button turns it off. So we've definitely got a problem with the power supply. I can't tell you how elated I am to, to, to see that. I was uh, thinking possibly that fuse holder in the back might have been the problem, but uh, obviously not. Let's try that again. Power it off and power it on again. We've got a self-test on the display, so the display is good. So I think we've got something wrong on the CPU side, which is causing the buttons not to work. What a single intermittent beep like that means, I will have to look up the service manual if I can get one to see what that means. Looks like every 10 or 15 seconds or so it gives out a single beep. Let's measure the output just to see if we've got anything out of interest. Let's measure the output to see what's going on there. Minus 0.5. And the buttons here are not doing anything to adjust that value. It just seems to be stuck at minus 0.5. And the output on and off is just doing nothing as well. So we've definitely got a problem with the power supply. So I think we'll take it apart and let's see if we can investigate the, the circuit board on the bottom of the power supply and see what we can find. Okay, so it looks like we've got a genuine fault. So I'll need to rip the unit apart and get to the motherboard in the bottom. The reason I say that, my friend has just come back to me with a translation of this uh, Chinese or Taiwanese text here and it says motherboard open circuit on this side and over here it just says faulty. So that kind of goes along exactly with the result I'm getting on the display i.e. a blank display so I need to get down onto the motherboard and let's take a look. Okay I've disassembled the power supply but it's still intact, it's still all wired up transformer off the side there it's rather heavy so I've got it supported underneath and the wiring's a little bit short but I think it's stable enough and I've got the front panel disconnected and it's down at the side here so I'm just going to power it up to make sure it still works so let's put power in yep looks like I've got the same power up as before so with it all exposed now, the circuit board, the main circuit board exposed, I should now be able to probe around and uh, see if I can locate any problem as to why the uh, appears like the processor is not starting up or some element is not starting up that's stopping it uh, right into the display. So uh, let's uh, get the camera overhead and let's do some probing. So from what I can see so far, somebody's been in here before, the screws that held down the transformer onto this top plate here were slack and indeed the uh, varnish or residue that was on the top here was broken at all four points so I think somebody yes had the, the, had the transformer out and down on the main board there is some flux residue round about some of the ICs and some of the resistors. Let's see if I can zoom in. So here we go, round about this area here, a solder iron has definitely been uh, used here, definitely on some of those resistors there, and over there on this IC as well, and uh, some of the other ICs out of shot. Um, just wondering what's going on there, maybe someone's just had a, a, a bit of an attempt at trying to solve the problem by resoldering some joints I don't really know but we'll get a schematic out I've never worked on one of these before I don't know the architecture um, but I'm sure I'll be able to work that out from the schematics and let's see if we can probe around the first thing to do is to check all the supplies and then after that I'll probably 
take a look at the processor and let's see if that's working. I presume it is because there is some timing involved in beeping the main uh, panel there as you can hear it every five seconds or so and one of the buttons is reacting on the display that's bringing up uh, a few characters on the display so I presume the processor is okay which is probably a good thing um, and it's maybe some of the ancillary um, ICs around about that that uh, basically controlling the display that might be the problem so I mean that's just a guess at the moment but uh, let's get in there and have a look here's the main board You've got a microcontroller down there, an ASIC there, an EEPROM and a RAM IC here. And then you've got a display connector here. This cable is plugged in here, goes away off to the back of the display board here. The display board actually has a microcontroller on it. So there's a four wire serial link between the main board and the display board in order to pass the data obviously to be displayed. And because there's a microcontroller on the main board, um, when I power up the unit here, as you saw earlier, I'm basically just getting uh, nothing on the display. I'm getting a self-test on the display, which I think is being handled by the microcontroller on here. That would seem to make sense. And that's working okay. Uh, and I think there's no data thereafter reaching the display hence it stays blank and this one button that is operating here that seems to be uh, bringing up uh, one of the uh, annotations on the display is working because it's probably handled locally by the microcontroller here so first thing I want to do is see if the microcontroller down here is still working so to do that I'm gonna to have to scope it uh, it's just a basic test I'm gonna check the reset I'm gonna check the clock etc and just see if it's given an idea to me that it's still working now I do actually have a set of schematics for the power supply which is absolutely brilliant here's the microcontroller the ASIC there the SRAM here EEPROM there and this is the display connector here which has got the four wire interface I think it looks like it interfaces between the microcontroller and also the ASIC as well going away off to the display you've got the clock generator over here coming into the microcontroller and a reset line and then the over current protection and over voter protection uh, trip uh, functionality over on the left here and fan fail coming into an op amp there as well so it's fairly simple on the processor side so the first thing I'm going to do is scope the four wire interface to see if that's active um, I'm thinking it won't be because the display is completely blank uh, during normal operation and then there's this single beep every now and then not sure what that is haven't researched that as yet and you can also see the minus 17.4 and the plus 17.4 uh, power supply going away off to the display board as, as well. There's no real 5 volt supply or anything like that going away off to the display board. The display board microcontroller etc. I think 0 volt references the minus 17.4 volt voltage level and is regulated down to minus 12.4 to give that uh, positive supply rail to the microcontroller ICs etc. Uh, that's what it's looking like at the schematics so far. Um, so let's scope the four wire bus and see if we're getting anything, anything on that. So I've been looking at the schematic for the front panel and I'm trying to work out how the data gets back from the front panel down on the main board because that's got to happen somehow and I've accounted for every pin on this connector bar one and if you look at pin two and follow it back it comes from the output of this comparator here and what I think is happening here is this the three pins that come in the three serial data pins that come in from the main board come in here and they're marked uh, I think this one's clock coming into this level shifter here then you've got what's that DI that'll be data input and you've also got int INT that'll be interrupt so there's three lines there that make their way 
via the shift register back to the microcontroller. So that's how the microcontroller on the front panel gets data from the main board. Now if you look at the clock pin comes through this level shifter here, it actually goes not only to the shift register, it also goes up to the microcontroller but also importantly down to this NOR gate here via a flip-flop to the comparator. So what I think is happening is the main board clocks data into the front panel uh, a certain number of cycles on that clock will clock in all the data that's required to go to the front panel but that same clock then clocks data back from the front panel back down onto the main board via the output of this uh, comparator here and that's hence like I said that's why the clock uh, signal from the front panel connector is connected to the shift register, the microcontroller and also the comparator. The other side of the NOR gate which shares uh, uh, with the clock pin comes directly from the microcontroller itself and it's also connected to the shift register as well so I'm not entirely sure what's going on but that's what I think is happening here. It's shifting the data, the clock signal from the main board is shifting the data in and at the same time once that's finished it's then shifting data back out to the main board. So what would be interesting to do is scope pin 2 uh, and see if we're getting anything. Now it might not mean anything if we don't get anything in the scope because the microcontroller might not do anything if it can't receive any data from the main board in the first place. But interesting to see if we're getting anything on pin 2 anyways. So let's do that now. Right, it's pins 4, 6, 8 and 10 is which I'm looking for on this connector. So 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll switch on the power supply. got masking tape on the top of the heat sink. That's just to uh, compensate the white balance so that we can actually see the, or you can see the board a little bit better. So this is pin 4, power up, got 5 volt logic level on that pin and it did pulse there and then remains high again. Oh, let's try that again. Switch off, maybe it was just me with a scope probe. Try again, try not to move it. No, nothing on that one. Switch it off again. Five and pin six now. It's high again. Nothing, just a five volt logic level. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, sorry. Eight. This is pin eight. Nothing. Nine and ten. And ten. So we're not getting anything on that four wire serial interface to the display. So at the moment I'm going to rule out the display as being a problem and I think we're back onto the main board and something's not right here. So thinking a little bit more about this idea of clocking the data back, I was thinking if there was a fault on the display board it could actually stop data coming from the main board up onto the display. So I took the opportunity just to remove the PCB from the front panel. Now somebody's had this in bits before. Uh, there's a couple of little plastic brackets on the inside of the housing here which were broken off. This one here was broken off which uh, uh, the, the board goes in and then you slide it to one side to lock it under these tabs here and this one was already broken and the rotary encoder 
was actually in bits to tell you the truth because it's a little bit of a nightmare to slide out it's got a little elongated slot instead of a hole for the rotary encoder to go through which is a nut on the other side it's elongated so that the board will slide so that you can lock it and obviously take it out as well and it was a bit of a mess so I'm not really sure what happened there so I think somebody's been inside the display so I've got the display board out now and unfortunately the display itself, the VFD itself is mounted over the top of virtually all the electronics on the board. So the only IC that's visible, uh, available to scope etc, is the comparator. And that's okay, it can get away with that. So what I'm going to do is scope the actual output of the comparator. I know we've already done that on the connector, but I'm going to do that on the comparator, but also the two inputs as well. I should be getting, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, some sort of pulsing on the positive input of the comparator. The negative input of the comparator, they've got a voltage divider here which basically splits the supply uh, across the um, signal they are going in so that you'll get a, a, a switching output. So let's get the scope on that and see what it's doing. So I've got the ground of the probe hooked up to the minus 17.4 volt supply. In order to do that I've had to hook up the isolation transformer to power the, uh, the, the power supply. So that's all done now. So there it is powered up we've got the self test there and let's go on to the comparator so we're now we're looking at pin 13 is the output so it's a 14 pin chip 14 pin chip so that's pin 13 and it's doing absolutely nothing sitting at uh, logic level zero and 10 and 11 are the inputs so 7 8 9 10 and 11. Now as you can see 10 there is sitting at about 2.5 volts which is about right you want uh, or 2.5 volts reference to the negative 17.4 volts dis um, supply of course um, so that's perfect that's right smack in the middle of the 5 volt logic that's going to be hitting it so there's no problem there but like I said pin 11 absolutely nothing it's sitting at logic level zero okay so after a little bit more digging through the schematics and there is some notes in the service guide um, looks like the sounder the beeper that you can hear I initially thought the beeper was being controlled by this microcontroller down here on the main board it's not there is actually another microcontroller uh, underneath the fan which is controlling the GPIB functionality the socket on the back and the sounder is actually connected to it also reading the service manual it says that on power up the microcontroller on display will put all digits on as I surmised earlier and during which the serial communication between the display board and the main board is checked to send data back and forward and if it agrees it allows it to go on and if it doesn't it produces an error code it also sounds the beeper twice. Now I'm definitely not getting that. But I'm definitely not getting any serial data either on power up between the front panel and the main board. So it's unknown at the moment whether the problem's on the main board or whether that is actually a problem on this display board which is halting that serial communication. I don't really know at this moment in time. Well, I just try to connect via GPIB on the back of the instrument, on the back of the power supply, but it wasn't having it. Um, it's something there, but I couldn't connect and establish a, a good connection. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is take the main board out and uh, let's see if we can uh, nail down the problem that way. Well, that's the board removed. Pretty easy to remove. Just a couple of screws, disconnect some wires and it slides out, so no problem at all. 
Um, one thing I've noticed on uh, some detail inspection of the board, there is a few ICs and components that have been resoldered. I think I mentioned that at the beginning of the video. But interestingly, these four ICs at the back there are the GPIB related uh, devices including that microcontroller that I was talking about that uh, sounds the beeper so they've been completely resoldered it looks like because of flux everywhere so I don't know if somebody's replaced all them but I'm thinking where would they get the code for the 8751 microcontroller I'm not really sure so unless they've just been touched up I don't know including these dip packages there and then, as like I said earlier, there's a few components on the main board uh, around about this area here that have been resoldered as well. But certainly, nothing's been soldered round about the uh, main uh, microcontroller and ROM and RAM and etc. I'm saying that's more likely they've just resoldered every joint on those uh, ICs. Uh, but. Uh, so I think that'll do for a part one of this video. Um, I think I'll have to do a little bit more of an investigation. Um, I'm going to try and uh, think the next thing I'll do, I'm going to try and power up the board when it's out of the chassis. Um, I think I should be able to do that. I should just be able to plug in no problem and get access to the board. Uh, so I can do some uh, troubleshooting down on this board here. And uh, what I might actually do as well is on this display board I might actually remove the VFD and uh, so I can get access to the ICs etc underneath yeah like I said that'll do for the part one and uh, let's look forward to part two which will be coming along hopefully pretty shortly thanks for watching